esses degraus ocultos são paralelos. A mesma coisa. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is our last day of the meeting. And now you're going to, to see and hear the presentation of uh, Silvio Sorella, who is uh, presenting online. Uh, good morning, Silvio. Can you hear good me? Good morning. Good morning. Yes, yes, very well. Yeah. Uh, so Silvio works in uh, UERJ, the, the State University of Rio de Janeiro. And he's going to talk about Bell's inequalities and quantum field theory. Thanks, Silvio. Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, thank you for the nice invitation. I am very happy to be with all of you, to see that all of you are in very good health, in very good shape. And uh, I am very, very happy to participate of this nice event. So today I will present something new. Uh, it's uh, a topic related to the Bell's inequalities in uh, relativistic quantum field theory. This is a project which I have started since more or less one year in collaboration with my uh, with Giovanni Pe Pe Peruzzo, uh, who is a collaborator of mine. So <clears throat> let me start with uh, a nice quote by John Bell. Uh, uh, John Bell once said, I am a quantum engineer, but on Sundays I have principles. <laughs> okay, so I, I have tried to, to, to make a presentation, a very simple presentation, starting uh, from quantum mechanics, just to give a general overview of what is going on in quantum field theory. So, as all of you uh, know very well, we have uh, Alice and Bob. Alice uh, has a spin one half. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Bob two. <clears throat> so uh, Alice is uh, measuring uh, the spin uh, along two directions, alpha and alpha prime. And uh, Bob also is, measure, is measuring his spin along two directions, beta and beta prime. And uh, Bob and Alice are very, very far away. So this means that uh, a measurements done by Alice does not depend on the settings of Bob uh, device and vice versa. In relativistic terms, we could say that uh, uh, Alice and Bob are space-like separated, so they cannot communicate by sending a signal traveling at the speed of light. So uh, Alice is measuring two observables, A and A prime. A is the projection of the spin along the direction alpha. Uh, a is uh, emission and the eigenvalues are plus or minus one. And alpha prime is the, the same. The only change is the direction. And uh, <clears throat> alpha and that, that alpha primes are arbit arbitrary directions and uh, they are unit vectors. Uh, Bob does the same. So Bob measures two observables. B and B prime. Uh, B is the projection of the Bob spin along the direction beta, and uh, uh, B, B prime uh, is the measurements of the spin along a second direction. Beta and B prime are <clears throat> unit vectors too. So after that, one looks at the correlation functions, which means we look at those quantities here, okay? Where psi is some state. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> as you, you know, the Hilbert space of the total system, the system of Alice and Bob, is the tensor product of the Hilbert space of Alice times the Hilbert space of Bob. So a state, in general, a, a wave function is 
uh, not entangled if the wave function can be written as a product of something which belongs to the Hilbert space of Alice times something which belongs to the Hilbert space of Bob. So, for example, this state here is not entangled. On the other hand, if the <clears throat> A wave function cannot be written in that way. Uh, this means that we uh, are not able to write the wave function as a product state, uh, meaning that the wave function cannot be factorized in that way. The state is called entangled. An example of an entangled state is given by the famous Bell singlets. So. This is a, an example of uh, an entangled state of two spins, one half. So uh, computing the <clears throat> correlation function in quantum mechanics uh, by using an entangled state gives the very famous result that the correlation function is given by the minus the cosinus between the angles of the direction alpha in which Alice is measuring and the direction beta in which Bob is measuring. So this is a very, very famous and important result. For, exa for example, if alpha and beta are parallel, which means that Alice and Bob are measuring along the same direction, the cosinus is minus one, which means that we have a perfect correlation. So this means that uh, if Alice will measure plus one, Bob will measure minus one, always and vice versa. And this independently from the distance between Bob and Alice. Uh, on the other hand, if alpha and beta are orthogonal, hmm, for example, uh, if Alice measures along the Z axis and the Bob measures along the X axis, then uh, there is no correlation. So the results are uncorrelated. So this is a very, very important and famous result of quantum mechanics. And uh, uh, what about the, the Bell's inequalities? Uh, uh, this is a very long story. Uh, uh, it started in 35 with the famous paper by uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And in, in this paper, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen discovered the entangled states in quantum mechanics. But they, they tried to go beyond the mathematical aspects of uh, uh, <clears throat> the entanglement. And they tried to, to face the very complicated issue of the physical meaning of entanglement. And this was the beginning of a very long and uh, fascinating debate. And almost everybody took, uh, participated of the debate. Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, Bohr, Born, Jordan, Pauli, Schrödinger, Eisenberg, Bohm, Feynman, everybody. And the debate was on almost everything. For example, many questions were put on the table. For example, what really is quantum mechanics? Uh, it is a complete or an incomplete theory. What is lo locality versus non-locality? What is causality? What is the meaning of a measurement? What we can call reality? I mean, it was very, very fascinating uh, debate. And uh, beside quantum mechanics, <clears throat> a very large set of alternative theories, named local hidden variables theories, were created in order to reproduce the uh, uh, correlation function of quantum mechanics. If you want to have a look at uh, uh, the history and the applications of the hidden variables, you, you might have a look at this very nice report. It's quite recent. So uh, 
uh, it was believed uh, somehow that uh, uh, due to uh, the problem related to entanglements, that the, uh, the results of quantum mechanics could be reproduced by using <clears throat> a suitable set of hidden variables. Uh, uh, the hidden variables are something encoded in the DNA of the quantum objects like photons, electrons, and uh, uh, which means that uh, according to the Einstein point of view and uh, other uh, grandfathers of quantum mechanics, uh, is, is uh, the photon has something more and uh, we don't have access to those variables. Uh, this is why they are called it hidden variables. So it was believed that the correlation function of quantum mechanics could be, for, for example, this correlation here, which is uh, the correlation function between uh, the spin operator of Alice and the spin operator of Bob could be reproduced by using hidden variables, uh, which means that it could be written in that way. So lambda is a set of uh, hidden variables. Uh, they uh, might be continuous variables, discrete variables, uh, whatever you like. Uh, rho lambda is uh, a certain probability di distribution, so it's positive uh, and uh, is normalized to one. And uh, uh, the quantities A lambda alpha and B lambda beta have some classical quantities. Uh, which you can cook up and uh, which uh, will enable you to reproduce exactly the correlation function of quantum mechanics. Uh, one important point is the locality. The locality means that uh, the quantity A lambda alpha uh, does not de depend on the orientation beta of Bob device and vice versa. So this quantity A depends only on the hidden variables and on the orientation of the device of Alice. And uh, B depends only on the hidden variables and the orientation of the device of Bob. So, and <clears throat> indeed, uh, it is very amusing. It, I mean, you can, you can find a lot of examples, uh, even uh, in the original papers of Bell. Uh, he started always by showing that there are many, many examples in which you can really reproduce the result of quantum mechanics by using hidden local variable theories. There is, however, a, an exception, which is the entanglement. So this is the content of the Bell theorem. Uh, Bell, uh, in a five-page paper <clears throat> in uh, uh, 64, was able to prove that any local hidden variable theory must obey a certain inequality which is called the Bell inequality. Later on, a few years later, in 69, uh, Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt were able to present a simplified version of the Bell inequality, which is nowadays called the CHSH inequality, and which can be tested in experiments. This was a very big, big progress. So uh, <clears throat> the inequality uh, is this one. It tells us that any local hidden variable theory, uh, if you look at this particular combination, which is called the uh, CHSH combination, must be always uh, less than two. This for any local hidden variable theory. 
Now uh, you do the computation in quantum mechanics, which means uh, we compute the, exactly the same combination with the operators of quantum mechanics with the spins operator of Alice and Bob. We use here a, a, an entangled state, which is, for example, the Bell singlet state. And we don't find two. We find something which is greater than two, which is 2.8. This is really a very uh, surprising result. So any local hidden variable theory must obey this inequality. And on the other hand, quantum mechanics gives something which is greater is 2.8. So uh, as you, you see, A, A prime, B, B prime are the spin operators of Alice and Bob. This particular combination, when A, A prime uh, and B, B prime take values in the interval minus one and plus one is called the CHSH combination. So uh, the, the, in a certain sense, the Bell inequality uh, gives the opportunity to distinguish between uh, non-local, uh, local hidden variables theories and quantum mechanics. And uh, <clears throat> uh, as you know very well, John Clauser, Alena Speck, uh, Anton Zeilinger, uh, have been awarded by uh, with the Nobel Prize of this year for the experimental verification of the violation of the Bell inequalities. <clears throat> so uh, John Clauser started the first experiment at the end of the 70s. Alain Aspect refined uh, the experiments uh, by John Clauser at the end of the 80s. And Anton Seilinger is working on this till the present days. For example, if you look at a very nice paper by Seilinger published in Nature, a quite recent paper, uh, he uh, reports a value which is pretty close to 2.8, which is 2.74. The error is very, very small. I don't remember, but this is really very, very small. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, as far as, I mean, we, we uh, apparently we have the following situation. So, no local hidden variable theory can account for entanglement. Bell's inequalities are violated. Hmm? There is a big agreement on this. And uh, quantum mechanics, so far, seems to be the only theory which correctly describes entanglement. So this is the situation in quantum mechanics. Now, what about the Bell's inequality in quantum field theory? This is another story. Uh, the study of the Bell's inequality in quantum field theory is really at the beginning. And uh, there is, uh, I, I, I could say that there, there, there is an increasing interest in that uh, due to the next generation of experiment at LHC. For example, there, there is a great interest in process uh, like the decay of the X in an entangled pair of W boson. And apparently this uh, uh, decay can be uh, studied at LHC with great precision. And then it is believed that the LHC is the best machine in the world to study the violation of the Bell's inequality. So uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the main efforts done to, today about entanglement are not really focused on uh, the Bell's inequalities. Uh, 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 the main effort is done to understand uh, in quantum field theory what is the entanglement entropy, which is another very important uh, quantity to uh, quantify the degree of entanglement 
of a very, very large uh, class of systems going from QCD uh, to black holes, uh, to quantum informations and so on. So the entanglement entropy is a very fundamental quantity. And so almost everybody is looking at this, but not directly at the Bell's inequalities. So as far as the Bell's inequalities are concerned, uh, we have a very few papers. Huh? Uh, we have essentially the pioneering papers by Summers and Werner. And uh, Summers and Werner wrote uh, a, a, a certain number of papers uh, between the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s. Uh, you can find here the original uh, uh, references. Uh, they, uh, um, <clears throat> they have used uh, the algebraic quantum field theory, which is a, ve a very sophisticated uh, tool uh, to investigate the uh, Bell's inequality in quantum field theory. So uh, the main result uh, by Summers and Werner is that the phenomenon of entanglement in quantum field theory seems to be much more severe than in quantum mechanics. So, for example, uh, one very important result that they derived is that even free fields, uh, even free fields, a uh, bosonic or uh, fermionic fields, might lead to a violation of the CHSH inequality in the vacuum. This is a very important result and it gives you an idea of the strength of entanglement in quantum field theory. So even free fields could produce entanglement. So let me describe a little bit the, the framework uh, uh, <clears throat> outlined by Summers and Werner. So you start with a set of fields, a set of free fields, bosonic, fermionic, and then you introduce uh, some emission bounded operators. Huh? So you, you need to introduce uh, the analog of the spin operators of uh, Alice and Bob, uh, but in this case, they will depend on the fields. Uh, the important point is that the those operators A, B, A prime, B prime, must lie in the interval minus one, plus one, exactly like in the quantum mechanic case. So this is the first point. Uh, the second point is uh, we have to implement the principle of relativistic causality uh, in order to, uh, to be sure that uh, there is no possible uh, communication between Alice and Bob. So we have to localize uh, the lab of Alice in a certain region of the space time, say omega a, and we have to localize the lab of Bob in another region of the space time, say omega b. And uh, it is important that uh, omega a and omega b are space like. So, <clears throat> which means that uh, uh, the interval uh, between uh, the space time interval between Alice and Bob is less than zero. Uh, the localization is a technical procedure which is achieved by introducing smooth test functions. Uh, uh, for example, we, we can work with the so called bump functions. Uh, uh, we take a, a smooth uh, uh, <clears throat> function which is uh, uh, continuous, all the derivatives are continuous functions. And this function here uh, is non-zero only uh, between uh, minus one and plus one, and then it is zero outside. So uh, this function here localizes, for example, uh, a quantum field in the region uh, minus one plus one. So uh, from the technical point of view, we work with the localized field. So this is the quantum field, 
this is the localized function which localizes the field in a certain region of the space time according to uh, uh, <clears throat> to the requirement that Alice and Bob must be space like separated. Then uh, uh, we look at uh, this famous combination here, which is the uh, CHSH combination, uh, where A, A prime, B, B prime are operators built out with the quantum fields, which take values between minus one and plus one. And, uh, from the classical point of view, applying the triangle inequality, it is very simple to show that this combination here must be always less than two. This is very similar to uh, the, the, the original Bell theorem. Now you compute the same quantity at the quantum level. For example, you compute this particular combination here in the uh, vacuum of the theory, which can be the Fock vacuum, for example, in, in, in the free theory. And if this quantity here is greater than two, then we speak about a violation of the CHSH inequality in quantum field theory. So essentially, this is uh, the setup worked out by Summers and Werner, in short. So uh, in practice, uh, how we can uh, define bounded operators which take values in the interval minus one plus one? Well, there is a, a class of operators well known in quantum field theory, which uh, is called the, the vile operators. So the vile operators, is nothing but the uh, uh, exponential of the quantum field. So since it is the exponential, uh, the quantum field is a, a non-bounded operator. The while operator is a bounded operator. And uh, the while operators, uh, they satisfy a very nice algebra. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the product of the two while operators, uh, the product of the two vile operators gives again a vile operators and gives this exponential factor here, where this quantity here is precisely the Pauli Jordan function. So this quantity here encodes uh, the relativistic causality, huh? uh, which is intrinsically present when you localize the field in a certain region of the space time. So uh, uh, you can compute very easily the, uh, the product of two vile operators by using this uh, uh, famous relationship. Then uh, you easily find the Pauli-Jordan function, which is defined in that way. This is well known from quantum field theory textbook. And uh, the Pauli-Jordan function has a very important property. It vanishes when the uh, distance between X and Y is space-like. So uh, uh, the algebra of the vile operators uh, contains the uh, relativistic causality in a very intrinsic way. This is very beautiful. And then uh, what we have done in a recent work, we have, uh, uh, we have been able to, to, to define a very simple model. Huh? Uh, uh, we have constructed a quantum field theory with uh, two scalar fields, one field for Alice and one field for Bob. Then we have introduced an internal index, I, I runs from one to three, and uh, it is in the adjoint of SU2. So it is something which uh, can be compared to the, somehow to the spin index. It is 
say the ISOSP, something like this. Of course, the, this is just a toy model. So, uh, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's amusing that you can, uh, you can do this. So we have introduced uh, four vectors, A, A prime, B, B prime, uh, much like the four vectors uh, of the original uh, Alice and Bob spin correlation function. And then we have introduced uh, uh, a special combination of the bile operators, uh, the cosinus. So we have uh, this combination of the bile operator where uh, this is uh, the Alice field, this is the Bob field, and uh, of course, the cosinus is just a combination of the two bile operators. And uh, since it is the cosinus, it takes values into minus one and plus one. So this quantity is uh, a bounded quantity in the fields. And uh, by using uh, those quantities here, we have constructed following uh, the papers by Summers and Werner, the CH-SH combination, we have been able to compute uh, this correlation function exactly uh, in the Fock vacuum, and we have found a small violation of the uh, <clears throat> Bell inequalities according to uh, the original theorems by uh, Summers and Werner. So uh, you can see uh, a very nice plot here. The orange plane is the plane uh, uh, corresponding to the value of two. So uh, if the, there is no violation, uh, the, the blue curve should be uh, below <clears throat> the, the orange curve, and you can see here a small violation of the Bell inequality. Uh, also in this, uh, in this second plot, you can see a small departure from the value, the classical value too. So this is essentially what we have done. And uh, let, me, let me conclude. So we have followed the setup outlined by Summers and Werner, and we have been able to find a small violation using free fields. Uh, this is very nice, very good, and we have an, a very explicit example, very simple, of a quantum field theory which indeed violates the Bell inequalities at the quantum, at the quantum level. And now we are looking for more physical and uh, interesting model. For example, uh, uh, we are investigating the possibility of uh, uh, looking at the best inequality in gauge quantum field theories, and in particular, in the X model. Uh, the reason for this is that in the last few years, we have achieved a a gauge invariant description of uh, both X particle and of the gauge uh, boson. So <clears throat> uh, in a very few words, uh, in the last few years, together with uh, David, uh, Leticia, Bruno, Marcello, Marcio, and uh, other collaborators, we have studied the X model, both at the uh, abelian and non-abelian uh, level, and we have been able to identify a, a certain operators, for example, the operator V mu hmm, and the operator O. Uh, v mu is given by this quantity here, and uh, O is given by this quantity here. Both V mu and both O are BFST invariant, this is very, very important. And they give a physical description of the uh, <clears throat> gauge massive boson and of the X vector particle. We have studied the correlation function of those operators. We have shown that they have the same pole mass, the spectral density is positive, a lot of properties. V mu is a, a conserved car, and they have a lot, a lot of properties. 
uh, it is interesting to observe that the operator O and B mu were already uh, known, were, uh, they uh, were already proposed by Toft and by Frelich, Morchio and Strocchi many years ago. And uh, in a sense, we have rediscovered those operators and we have been able to uh, confirm a lot of properties. And uh, since they are BFS invariant, they can be exponentiated. Huh? They can be exponentiated naturally. So we have uh, a kind of uh, vile type operators. So we can construct in a very easy way the CHSH combination and we can study the Bell's inequalities in a, in a gauge theories by using a BLST invariant formulation. Uh, this is a very nice project. We are already looking at this. Another point which we are looking is the possibility of uh, formulating the, the Bell's inequality within the Feynman path integral. As far as I, uh, we know, there is uh, such a formulation has not yet been done. So the computation which I have shown before was done within the canonical quantization, but not with the Feynman path integral. This might look a, a quite simple uh, uh, step to, uh, <clears throat> to be solved, but in, indeed it, uh, apparently it's not so simple because I mean, the Feynman propagator is a very complicated object. First of, all, first of all, it is a complex quantity. It, it is uh, given by an anchor function or in momentum space by this quantity here, uh, which at the level of uh, distribution or the, uh, localized quantities can be understood in this way as the Cauchy principal value of this quantity here. And uh, then we have the contribution from the mass hyperboloid. And uh, uh, <clears throat> one other property of the Feynman propagator is that the Feynman propagator, uh, unlike the Pauli Jordan function, the Feynman propagator is not causal. So the Feynman propagator receives contributions from the space like region. So uh, there are a few points which are uh, quite delicate apparently in the formulation of band inequalities uh, within the Feynman path integral. We are studying very much this point. It's uh, very beautiful. And uh, at least for the example of the free field, which we have worked out so far, it seems to be okay. But I mean, this is a, I would say an important point because if you are able to, to formulate the best inequality within the path integral, uh, you can start immediately interacting the quantum field theory by using the language of uh, Feynman diagrams. And this is a very powerful, uh, a very, very, very powerful tool. Then we are also looking at the possibility if it exists, uh, of formulating the Bell inequalities directly in Euclidean. Uh, the, this is also another project. In Euclidean, we don't have the causality relations, we don't have the space-like, the time-like, but uh, somehow this is a kind of statistical quantum mechanics. So we could, uh, we could think about correlations and uh, uh, we could eventually uh, try to formulate the best inequality directly in Euclidean. If this would be possible, uh, we could eventually study the effects of, uh, for example, of confining propagators, like, for example, the Grib of propagators or the RGZ propagators directly in Euclidean space at the level of the Bell's inequalities and see what happens. For example, uh, what are the differences between uh, a confining and non-confining propagator at the level of Bell's inequalities? 
And this could be also very interesting from a lattice point of view because the best inequality could be studied in a very simple way on the lattice once we have the Euclidean formulation. So let me finish with another quote by John Bell. <laughs> so uh, John Bell in 81 said that uh, apparently separate parts of the world would be deeply entangled and our free will will be entangled with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for the attention and uh, uh, thank you. Okay, so. <clears throat> uh, I don't, don't know if uh, you have some, some question or some curiosity, yeah. Uh, thank you, Silvio, for a very nice seminar. Uh, I'm going to open for questions of the audience. Hi, Silvio. Uh, thank you very much for such a beautiful talk. I'm really, really impressed. Uh, I have a very naive question, but since you thought uh, a lot about that, I'm pretty sure. Uh, when you thought about uh, doing this in <clears throat> path integral uh, uh, formulation, I would wonder if that would be uh, a lot more complicated or less suited uh, for this, since you're kind of summing over uh, classical trajectories and in this sense, you would be like closer to classical physics in a way. Does it pose any uh, uh, difficulty, a special difficulty in your, in your opinion? Well, I mean, uh, you know that, uh, thank you very much for the question. I mean, uh, this is, I mean, it's really fascinating topic. I mean, well, I mean, uh, what I can say, well, we know that uh, Feynman was able to give a path integral uh, uh, description of quantum mechanics. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> So uh, it should be possible because, I mean, uh, the path integral uh, is a kind of a miracle. It works. I mean, it's really incredible. Uh, I agree that we are summing over uh, all classical paths, but still, I mean, you, you can reproduce the quantum mechanics by using uh, the path integral. So... I think that we should really be able to use the path integral in quantum field theory. It's really the natural language, I would say. Yes. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, it, it, I, 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 my answer, uh, despite all problems and all difficulties uh, posed by the Feynman propagator, they would be positive. So if, if I'm allowed to ask you a short a second question. Uh, so do you expect anything uh, profoundly new from, from gauge fields and in particular non-abelian non gauge fields in this kind of formulation? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> uh, I mean, as I say, there is a lot of, uh, of interest in the study of the decay of the X boson in an entangled pair of uh, W boson. Uh, in a relativistic quantum mechanics, in the uh, relativistic quantum field theory, there, there is a, a, a very uh, uh, big open problem about the maximum uh, value of the violation of the Bell inequalities. In, uh, in quantum mechanics, as I have uh, said, the maximum violation of the Bell inequality is given by two square root of two, which is 2.8. This is called the Tsirexon bound. And it is the maximum violation which can occur in quantum mechanics. Now, uh, there are the speculations uh, uh, on the possibility that uh, in relativistic quantum field theory, this number here uh, can be greater than 2.8, can be even equal to 4. 
So there is a very, a very famous paper by Popescu on, uh, who argued that uh, in quantum field theory, we should be able to see uh, bigger and the bigger uh, uh, violations of the uh, Bell's inequality. So, uh, of course, uh, maybe uh, gauge theories uh, will do the job. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> so there are a lot, a lot of questions. As far as I know, nobody has been able till now to study the Bell's inequality in uh, the BFST invariant way in a uh, quantum gauge field theory, both in the abelian and in the non-abelian case. So there are a lot, a lot of open questions. Yes, yeah, yes. So hi, Silvio. This is Leticia. Hi, Leticia. <laughs> nice. Thank you for the nice talk. I'm not sure if we're able to see us here. So I, I have a, a naive question out of curiosity. So is there any uh, like ten tentative interpretation of? the physics behind uh, the fact that in quantum field theory, you have free theory giving entanglement. So does anyone try to do what EPR did in the quantum case and be bold? Yeah, this is a very big, 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 big discussion, uh, which involves not only quantum field theory, involves uh, cosmology, black hole physics, uh, gravitation, I mean, uh, what is known, uh, for example, you can look at the, there is a very uh, beautiful set of lectures given by Harlow uh, in a Jerusalem school. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, apparently the community uh, agrees on the fact that, for example, in quantum field theory, the Fock vacuum, uh, the Fock vacuum, which is the state which is annihilated by all uh, 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 destruction operators, the Fock vacuum itself is already entangled. I, I see. Yeah, I imagine so the, this, the, the this is a, a this is a this is a big statement, and uh, you, to understand this statement, I, I have preferred not to mention this in the presentation because, I mean, it requires some time. But you, you have to make a, a deep study of the space-time, so you have to separate the, the space-time in the space-like and time-like region in the in the the space-like regions, you have the so-called Rindler modes, which are re related to the boost of the Lorentz group. And if you use the Rindler modes, you, you are able to show that the Fock vacuum can be written as an entangled combination of the, uh, with some coefficient, uh, coefficients here of the Rindler modes. Okay, this is like the Unruh effect. So as far as we know, the vacuum state of quantum field theory is already entangled. So this is why uh, even in a free quantum field theory, we are able to, uh, to see a violation of the Bell's inequality. This is very a big statement, which might have very, very big consequences. You can see also at a very recent report by Edward Witten on this, which is very beautiful. And so apparently quantum field theory is something uh, uh, really, I mean, uh, I would say that we are really at the beginning of a very long story between quantum field theory and entanglement. Probably we shall have many, many surprises yes, in the future. So uh, this is more or less, but this was not yet known at the time of the papers by Summers and Werner. So Summers and Werner uh, proved uh, their statement by using the algebraic quantum field theory. And later on, it was discovered that the, the, even the Fock vacuum is entangled 
in terms of the Dindler modes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you, Silvio, for a very nice explanation. We are short of time right now. Okay. <clears throat> very much for participation let's thank you again thank you thank you have a good day and uh, let's hope that the brazil will win <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you <clears throat>a brief introduction to motivate the model, which is the Curti Ferrari model that Madela, Marcela presented yesterday. The idea is to compute essentially several correlation functions at two loop order and compare the results with lattice data. So I will present the results for the ghost and the ghost gluon vertex, the three gluon vertex, the QCD propagators, and finally, I will present some conclusions and outlook. Now, if we want, com want to compute correlation functions in young Mills or QCD in the Euclidean, we typically find this unde undetermined quantity. And to get rid of this undetermined, we need to uh, fix the gauge. This is traditionally done via the Fadeh Popov method, which in Lado gauge uh, gives, uh, leads to this Lagrangian here, which is essentially the QCD Lagrangian. We have this term which is associated to the gauge fixing condition and we have the, the ghost, right? Now we have this Lagrangian, which is the gauge fixed Lagrangian. Now, how do we make actual calculations with this Lagrangian? Well, first of all, we can exploit asymptotic freedom in the UV. We, we know that the coupling becomes very small, so we can use just the gauge fixed theory and perturbation theory, and this works pretty well. But when we move towards the infrared, we find that the perturbative Fade Popov theory breaks down. We find the Landau pole, so we need a different approach to deal with the infrared of QCD. However, we need to take this Landau pole with a grain of salt because we know that we have the grip of copies which are harmless in the UV, but uh, when we move towards the infrared, they become increasingly dangerous. So new strategies are needed in order to access infrared QCD, as all of you probably know. So we have lattice QCD, as Teresa told us yesterday. So it is a first principles manifest leakage invariant, fully non-perturbative approach, and it has been widely used to study QCD, but it requires of a great amount of resources. And in some sense, it works as a sort of black box hiding potential interplays among the various elements of the theory. So continuum methods could be of help to solve this or to understand better this uh, interplays. Interplays. Now, we can broadly divide these methods according to how they respond to this question. How do we fix the gauge, right? We can promote some of these approaches, promote the Fadepo Popov Lagrangian to the non-perturbative level. And here we can include, for instance, Tyson Schwinger equations and functional renormalization group. Or we can try, it, try to include, in some sense, the effect of the group of copies in the infrared. We can try to do this motivated by first principles. And in some sense, this is what group of Swansinger formalism does. Or we can try to uh, be, let's say, phenomenologically motivated. And here we can include the model in which I worked, which is the Curti-Ferrari model. 
Now, the Kurtzi Ferrari model is motivated in this graph, essentially, which we have already seen several, time, several times in this workshop, which is the gluon propagator on the lattice, which saturates to a finite value at zero momentum. So it is consistent with a massive term for the gluon. So the idea is simply to add to the standard Fade Popov Lagrangian a massive term for the gluon. This is the idea. Now, this model is renormalizable. And uh, a nice feature of this model is that the Fade Popov Lagrangian is retrieved for momenta much larger than the gluon mass. This is say in the UV. And this is good because we know that Fade Popov works well in the UV. Now, I would like to emphasize here that this model is introduced at the gauge fixed level, right? So we are not proposing this as a sort of replacement of the standard QCD Lagrangian is uh, introduced at the level of the gauge fixed Lagrangian. Even though there are several good ideas, still it is not completely clear how the gluon acquires a mass in the infrared. And the Curtis Ferrari model does not attempt to explain this phenomenon, but to explore its consequences in a sense. So this is a model, we need to test it. It's not a first principles model. So how do we test it? Well, uh, the idea is to compute two and three point correlation functions and compare the outcomes with lattice simulations. This is the first step, right? Now, how do we make these calculations? Well, there are reasons to believe that we can use perturbation theory even in the infrared, at least in the pure gauge sector. And how how this is how this happens? Well, when we look at the at the lattice, we can look here at alpha strong. We already see uh, this graph also in this workshop. We can see that alpha strong is really small in the UV. Well, this is expected. This is asymptotic freedom. But when we move towards the infrared, we find that it grows, it reaches a maximum, and then it becomes small again in the deep infrared. We can take into account that the expansion parameter is not alpha, it's another quantity we called lambda here. And lambda is related to alpha through this equation. So uh, the expansion parameter is alpha multiplied by the number of colors, three, and divided by four pi. So this gives 0 0.3 at most, and this is consistent with a perturbative treatment, right? In principle, it, it could give reasonable results. In addition, the Curti Ferrari model features infrared safe renormalization flow trajectories, which are displayed here. As you can see here, we have blue trajectories, which are infrared safe. This is to say they are Landau pole free, right? And moreover, we can find among these blue trajectories, certain trajectories, for instance, this one here in orange, in which the expansion parameter remains small for the whole range of momenta. So this is compatible with perturbation theory, right? So several correlation functions have been evaluated at one loop order within the Curti Ferrari model and have been successfully compared with lattice data. This is essentially what Marcela and other collaborators have been doing. And the model has also been used to explore QCD at finite temperature and density also successfully. Recently, the two loop evaluation of the gluon and ghost propagators in the pure gauge theory was investigated. And here I am showing you the plot. Here on the left, we can see this is the gluon propagator. And on the right, we see the ghost dressing function. The black dots correspond to lattice data, whereas the blue curve to the one loop result and the red curve to the two loop result. And as you can see, both of them reproduce pretty well lattice simulations. And even more, the results improve as we increase the loop order, which is consistent with a perturbative expansion up, right? So the idea of the results I will present today is to extend the two loop evaluation to other two and three point correlation functions in four dimensions. In general terms, we intend to answer to these two questions. In the first place, to which extent the perturbative Curti Ferrari model is able to reproduce the lattice data? And moreover, is the perturbative series we are using under control, right? So I will start with the pure gauge theory, right? We will ignore the quarks in this part. So here we have the ghost and the ghost gluon vertex. We will consider the vanishing gluon momentum 
configuration. Sorry. So we can write this quantity in this way, and we will factorize here the, the color factor and also a gauge coupling. So essentially the quantity we are interested in is this one here in blue, which is the quantity also evaluated on the lattice. We want to go to two loop order. So we have the three level correction, the one loop correction, and finally the two loop correction here. So we have two diagrams and 29 diagrams. And just to give you a taste of these diagrams, I will, I draw them here. Essentially we have the two one loop diagrams. And then we have, we can consider first one loop corrections to one loop uh, diagrams. So we can include uh, one loop corrections to propagators, one loop corrections to vertices, and finally other diagrams, which are essentially this one here, and all the remaining uh, ones are non-planar, which vanish. It's easy to prove this because of the color factor. So after we have written down all these diagrams, we apply the Feynman rules and we obtain these sort of integrals here, where here we have the internal momenta, it's a two loop integral. So we have P and Q to internal momenta. We have the external momentum here denoted as K. And we have here this X, Y, et cetera, referred to the propagator. We have essentially massless or a massive propagator. In this case, it will be just the gluon mass, right? The idea to simplify this is in the first place to rewrite the terms appearing here in the numerator in terms of the quantities appearing in the denominator. This is to say the, the propagators, right? So after we do this with all the terms appearing in the numerator, we obtain uh, an integral like this, where in this case, alpha one, alpha two, et cetera, are arbitrary quantities, right? They are integral, but arbitrary. Finally, the idea is to reduce these integrals to a finite set of integrals called master integrals. These master integrals uh, have these exponents alpha i equal to one or zero, right? And we did this uh, via integration by parts identities algorithm, essentially in Mathematica. What is the advantage of using these integrals? Well, in the first place, as we work in dimensional regularization, we to renormalize. So we introduced the renormalization uh, renormalization conditions, which are given by, by these conditions here. Essentially, we impose that the gluon propagator and the ghost dressing function equal their tree level form at the renormalization uh, scale. And we also include to non-renormalization theorems here. These are non-renormalization theorems of, or the, of the model, but here we are extending, this is true for the diversion part of the C factors, and we are extending these conditions to the finite parts as well. Well, the vertex function renormalizes in this way. Of course, we have a ghost, an anti-ghost that gives this C here. We have a gluon field, and we have here the the gauge coupling, which we factorized out at the beginning. And this is equal to one because we are in the infrared safe scheme. So our vertex function is independent of the normalization scale. And uh, this quantity here, V is a pure prediction of the model because the two free parameters, which are given by the gluon mass and the expansion parameter here, we are including the running right? These are extracted from the fits of the two point functions. So we already have them and we just use these runnings. Well, so we did all these calculations. We have a lot of terms. So we need to, to make as many, uh, two cross checks to check that everything is fine. So in the first place, we uh, tested the UV behavior. We know for some theoretical reasons, what is the expected UV behavior of this quantity. So in order to test that we 
indeed had this behavior, we expanded analytically all the master integrals appearing in our result. This was okay. We proceeded similar in the case of the infrared behavior, right? We did the same thing. And finally, we checked the zero mass limit, the, which was already computed in the 98 by David Chef. And we checked that our results, our limit uh, did coincide with the result of David Chef. So here I am showing you the results. This is for the SU3 gauge group. In pink here, you see the one loop result. In orange, the two loop result. And this band is an estimate of the difference between one order and the next one, right? As you can see, the, the size of the band diminishes when we, when we move from one loop to two loop order. And this is consistent with the perturbative treatment, right? The error bars, unfortunately, are quite large. So it is not easy to say which one is describing better the lattice simulations, but in any case, both of them are quite good. And this is for SU3. Here I am showing you the results for SU2, which are much poorer, as you can see. This is not very good. And this has an explanation for us that is that when we look at the expansion parameter, this is different. In, in the case of SU3, it's smaller. Here in SU3, you can see the running in blue, and SU2 is, SU2 is here in pink. And as you can see, it's larger. So it is expected that perturbation theory, uh, perturbation theory to works uh, to works worse, right? So how can we fix this? Well, instead of trying to predict the vertex function, we can try to fit simultaneously the three quantities at the same time. Right, this is less ambitious, and here I am showing you the results, which are which are much better than in the previous case. We also check the skin dependence of the result. The idea is the following: we um, did the calculations using another renormalization scheme, and the idea is that if the two-loop result is, let's say, more precise, then it should be less sensitive to changes in the renormalization scheme. So, here we are measuring this renormalization scheme dependence. And as you can see in SU3, when we move from one to two loop, this, this dependence diminishes. And this is not the case for SU2, which increases. So this is in line with what we uh, saw in the previous slides. In the case of the three gluon vertex, we proceed in a similar manner. We factorize out again the color factor, the gauge coupling and we uh, compute this quantity in the asymmetric configuration. Its tensorial form can be de decomposed in, in this way. We are interested in this quantity, the three gluon resin function, which is the one computed on the lattice. And it can be proven simply, you, you put this quantity uh, here, and you can see that this equals gamma A here. So we are interested in, in this quantity here. Again, we have the three level correction, one loop and two loop, and we reduce the master integrals similarly to the previous case. We renormalize, but in this case, this quantity here is no longer one, so this quantity does depend on the renormalization scale. And when uh, we substitute these C factors, we expand in lambda and we take the lambda square order, right? We implemented similar cross checks. And here I am showing you the results. This is for the SU3. This is also a prediction, but here we have also a normalization that we chose in order to minimize the difference between lattice data and our prediction. The blue curve is the two loop evaluation and the uh, black curve, the one loop. And we compared with two set of lattice data, because as you can see, we have differences here towards the infrared. So we wanted to compare with both of them. Here, this is this here is the, uh, the error associated, the error between our model and the lattice data in the case of the propagators. And here, this is the error of the, of the vertex function, right? Here, this A corresponds to this set of lattice data and this C here to this set of lattice data. And as you can see in both cases, the error uh, diminishes from one to two loop order. Of course, you can see that here the zero crossing is 
crystal clear in the one loop case. But when we go to two loop, it seems that the zero crossing disappears. But as we will see in a moment, this is not the case. The thing is that the zero crossing has gone very deep in the infrared in this case. The results for the SU2 group are quite similar to SU3. In this case, we do not observe significant differences between SU3 and SU2, right? Still, the error is a little bit larger, but it diminishes from one to two loop order. And we also estimated the scheme dependence and is consistent with the perturbative treatment for both SU3 and SU2. In this case, the scheme dependence diminishes. Five minutes? Okay, I will speed up. So we can prove that, that the exact leading infrared behavior is given by this quantity here. Uh, I will not go into details, but the zero crossing is, is given by, by this logarithm. Here. And this is true for all the orders of perturbation theory. So this is an exact property of the Curti Ferrari model, right? And we checked that this, is, this holds this expression for, um, for our two loop expansion. Now I will end with the QCD propagators. And we have to be careful here because the use of perturbation theory with quarks is much more delicate than in a pure gauge sector. The idea is that the coupling controlling the expansion is larger in this case. And in addition, we have that the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry, we know that cannot be captured by using a purely perturbative approach. So with this work, we aim at distinguishing perturbative quantities from those which are not. We believe that those quantities which are not directly impacted by the breaking of chiral symmetry are perturbative, whereas quantities which uh, are sensitive to this phenomenon are non-perturbative, right? So in order to test this, we compared with two set, sets of lattice data, one close to the chiral limit and one far from it. So we, compare, we computed these quantities, gold dressing function, gluon dressing function, quark dressing function, the quantities in blue, we expected them to be perturbative, whereas the quantity in red, we expect it to be non-perturbative, right? We proceeded similarly to the other case. And we started doing first a global fit of the three dressing functions, which we expect them to be perturbative, right? And we just excluded completely the mass. And here I am showing you the results. Here we have the dressing functions for the gluon and the ghost. And here we have the quark dressing function, which is probably the most impressive result of, of this work, because as you can see, the one loop calculation does not reproduce the lattice data even at a qualitative level. So this is quite impressive. This needs an explanation, of course. And the idea is that uh, when we uh, calculate this quantity, in the case of the massless gluon theory, right, this correction is zero, vanishes. Here we are putting massive gluons, so this is no longer zero, but still we believe it's too small, that we need to include the two loop corrections to actually uh, consider the full, let's say, leading correction to this quantity. And this seems, this is, uh, well, shown here in this picture, All right? We do not observe significant differences to the case far from the chiral limit. And just to, I will end with this because I'm running out of time, right? Two minutes, okay. So to end with the presentation, I will show you what occurs with the quark mass. So we'll try to predict it. So the idea is we will predict it from the fits of the three dressing functions. However, it is not reasonable to determine the quark mass without considering what happens on the lattice with the quark mass, right? So the idea is to determine the values of the gauge parameter and the gluon mass from the fits of the dressing functions. And we will impose the quark mass to be equal to a value of the lattice in the UV, right? All of these quantities run for us, right? So we just put the initial conditions and then with the beta functions, we, we find the running functions. And here I am showing you the results. This is for the case close to the chiral limit. And this is for the case far from the chiral limit. And as you can see in this case, we cannot recover the mass in the infrared, but this is expected. We know that this is non-perturbative. I would like to say that the Curti Ferrari model is not to blame for this behavior, but the technique we are using, which is perturbation theory, right? As Marcela told you yesterday, if you, if you use a different approach, in this case, you can just 
uh, make a perturbative expansion in the gauge coupling and retain all orders in the quark coupling. And you use also a, an expansion in the inverse of the numbers of colors. Well, if you do all of this, you can recover uh, the quark mass, even in this case, by using the Curti Ferrari model, right? If you use plane perturbation theory, you cannot. And in this case, far from the chiral limit, you can see that we can recover up to a certain extent the mass in the infrared. And this is reflected here in this error, in this error table here. So in this case, we can still use perturbation theory. It is reasonable up to a certain extent. So, okay, I finish with this. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Noel, for a nice talk. Uh, any question? Uh, the first uh, answer would be uh, no, because this is very restricted to the. This is very motivated by by this behavior, right? by the, the gluon propagator on the lattice. And we know that this behavior like this occurs in Landau gauge. So I don't know really how to, to, how to extend to other gauges. Well, in linear gauge, we could do something similar then, but it, we are very restricted to, to, to this uh, behavior, let's say. Almost no difference. No, we could try, we could try. That's a good idea. I think we could try in the linear gauge. No, Marcella, I don't know. But it, it seems reasonable to me. No, good idea. Yeah, we should try it, I think. Yeah, yeah, you could generalize, yeah. But, but we are not using the, the general version of Curti Ferrari, right? We are restricting to this particular case. So we are not saying the general model of Curti Ferrari from the 70s, it's true or whatever. We are just saying, okay, this model in this particular gauge, in this particular form works like very restricted. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, can I ask you about uh next picture or two picture yes you, you tell me where stop there yeah but yeah in this picture you show the land over and the mass of the gluon yes uh, in this case the arrow is in the infrared limit or not no i ask him because if we see the, this graph said that you go to infrared yes the yes grow up a lot um, it's a big number but uh, you, you said that you can calculate the mass of the, the running mass for the, the, the gluon too. Can you show this? Because here I said that the, you go to infrared, the mass is bigger. Yes. It's not that you go to a fixed point or something like that. It's different. Well, yes, you have here two uh, fixed points. This is actually the, this diagram is made at one loop order. You have also one up two loop order, which is quite similar. Yes, in this case, actually, yes, this trajectory, the mass, it's quite large, but in, in our case, we we actually found the running for, for lambda and also for the mass, and it is okay. Actually, what you find is that, that your mass goes to zero in the in the UV right it grows obviously towards the infrared but actually it becomes uh well i don't know very deep in the infrared if, if it becomes zero again yes it becomes zero again very deep in the infrared. but does this is in one loop calculation this is it, this is the result of, of one loop calculation yes this is perturbation theory it, yes yes let's thank now we again Hello, hello. Uh, so now uh, we have uh, uh, the pleasure of presentation of uh, Luis Oxman from uh, Federal University of 
from the mess. From the mess. <laughs> so, please. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to participate here in this, this meeting. And okay, I'll discuss about uh, my recent work together with Hugo Reinhardt from Tübingen and David Jr. Okay. Uh, and uh, also, also Gustavo participated in some way in, in previous works in this uh, line. And um, so let me start with my main uh, line of research, which is, which is the uh, center vortex approach to confinement. And so initially, what is a center vortex? Uh, so if you are in four dimensional Euclidean space time, uh, uh, center vortices are gauge field configurations uh, here. Gauge field uh, configurations, uh, which uh, whose field strength is, lo is localized on a closed surface. Okay, so uh, when you compute the Wilson loop, uh, you get the center element, which depends on the linking number between the, the center vortex wall surface and uh, the Wilson loop. Okay, and uh, the point is that these uh, degrees of freedom have uh, been detected in 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 the young vacuum using lattice calculations. Uh, uh, and, and for example, you get a, a finite density when you when you go to the continuum limit in the lattice, you get a finite density, so you know, it, 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 it is physical. Uh, and the confinement is obtained as a transition from large uh, world surfaces to uh, a, a small uh, world surfaces. In the confining phase, you have a huge uh, world surfaces which percolate. Okay, and with this idea. Uh, when you compute the Wilson loop average, you get analyty because everything depends on analyty here. Because here you have, uh, okay, here you have this uh, center element which depends on the representation of the quark, of the quarks, and this center element, uh, this uh, the, the way the the center of the group is realized in this representation, it is uh, is uh, depends on the analyty. Okay, so. Uh, and this uh, behavior of confinement, uh, the, the string tension at asymptotic distances depends on analysis. So these degrees of freedom are quite, quite natural to describe this main property of confinement at asymptotic distances. Okay, so um, here we have, uh, for example, well, in, the, in, in this, uh, here we have a, just an oriented uh, center vortex loop, which propagates in Euclidean space time, let's say. So uh, you have some creation of the loop and then an annihilation, you can think this way. And this, um, this uh, loop maps, which uh, maps uh, a world surface, okay? But the, the point is that these loops are characterized by the weights of the uh, defining representation of SUN, okay? So you have N different magnetic weights, and the sum of these weights uh, is zero. So you can have some matching rules between these uh, different uh, uh, center vortex lines now. For example, you can have a red line here. You can uh, you have a red line here and, and here and, and a green one and a blue one, which can match. This is the case of uh, N equals three, uh, three for SU3, okay? You can have three. Uh, different uh, center vortex lines which are created they are matched because they they charge is sum to zero and they propagate and you have this for example this kind of closed uh, world surface which is in fact characterized by the uh, different components associated with the propagation of the lines okay of three lines here but if you have a sun then you would have the matching of uh, n different lines with different uh, weights okay and uh, this, this, this degrees of freedom, this oriented center board, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the, the point is, uh, as I, I explained, they, they are observed in the lattice, you, you do different simulations and uh, you can uh, remove them, you can, uh, in the lattice, people has different ways to detect these degrees of freedom. If you re uh, remove uh, them, you lose uh, confinement. If you put them alone, then you reproduce uh, string tension with tonality, et cetera. But of course, uh, there are some uh, many many doubts in the in the community, which is uh, diminishing now. The community, the people that does uh, simulations in the lattice, is not almost working anymore on this because the money goes to the spectrum of QCD. <laughs> okay, but anyway, this is an essential problem of understanding confinement, which is the, the origin of confinement. So, uh, 
let me explain uh, which is the point of view we, we have in our group um, and and we believe we have some understanding of what's going on in confinement uh, and let me uh, discuss the role of non-oriented center vortices okay uh, these are degrees of, uh, in general center vortices for example can be detected in the indirect maximal center gauge where you start with a link variable in SUN, then you go to the Cartan in the maximal abelian gauge, and then you use these Cartan variables to uh, project to the center gauge. Okay, this is the indirect center gauge. What is nice about this, this uh, gauge in the, in the lattice is that you can use the center to detect center vortices, but then you can use the, the Cartan variables to see what's going on with the flux orientation. Uh, it's like the center vortices is like some kind of bones, and the, and the Cartan degrees of freedom gives some meat to the, because I'm from Argentina, so for me it's important this picture. But okay, so um, so you have these uh, flux the, associated with the Cartan directions that can uh, change at monopoles. So. Um, and in fact, for example, for SU2, where these simulations were done, 61% uh, of the vortex lines have no monopoles, but 31% thir thir uh, uh, contain a monopole and monopole pair, and 8% of closed vortex lines have a number, an even number of, of pairs. So in general, the situation is more like this. You have a lot of configurations which look like, like this. You have a, a, a red uh, center vortex, vortex line, which changes to a blue center vortex line. This propagates. And at the junction between beta one and beta two, you have a monopole. So, uh, so the point is, you have these different degrees of freedom. You have oriented center vortices; they, they can they have an, an matching rules. They can match and lines. You can match them at a given point. But also, a given uh, weight can change. Beta one can change to a different one at a monopole junction. Okay, so. Uh, the, uh, the, for example, here you have another configuration where red goes to green, goes to, to blue. This is an, another possibility. And you have, in this case, the propagation of uh, three uh, monopole word lines because uh, this change from red to green it, it leaves a, a charge with, which is adjoint. And the monopoles are in the adjoint representation. So you have three different charges for adjoint monopoles propagating in this configuration as well. Okay. Uh, so the question, what is the role of oriented and non-oriented center vortices for confinement? Uh, there are different uh, people that think, for example, uh, maybe that they, they are two alternative descriptions of uh, the physics of confinement. There is a group in the lattice that says, no, monopoles is the real thing. And the other group says, not center vortices are the, the main characters. So, uh, but the question is, is are they different uh, points of view for the same physics of confinement or not? Okay. And there is another, if you talk to different people, they say, uh, no, monopoles are irrelevant, these non oriented components, because when you compute the, for example, if you compute the, 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 uh, the Wilson loop, for an unoriented center vortex and the Wilson loop for an unoriented one, you get the same center element. So you have the same center element, so they are irrelevant. The effects on the, center, on the Wilson loop is the same. This is another way of thinking, but uh, I, I try to show you that this is not the point. This is not the case. Uh, in fact, uh, the idea is that you have to consider all these degrees of, of freedom to understand uh, confinement. Uh, so in general, the idea uh, in, in the lattice, for example, is uh, okay. We have uh, uh, in, not in the lattice. You can we have the we pick these ideas from the lattice and say, okay, let's try to uh, model uh, the the average of a lot of center vortices, uh, center elements. Okay, you have the linking number, and then you have a weight for the different uh, configurations. So when you do some average in in, uh, in an ensemble, okay, you need the different weights and the point is that the weights of monopoles, although the, 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 the observable, the, the center element you generate with oriented or non-oriented center vortices is the same, the, the weight is different. So the idea, uh, the point is that the different weights will give to a different uh, physics, which is much closer to the uh, real world. 
Okay. Uh, here in uh, 2018, uh, I proposed a, a, a model uh, which is based in the on the lattice where you generate closed surfaces. Uh, these closed surfaces uh, are center vortices. So uh, in the model, which is given by Wilson action for SUN variables, you have some frustration. And this frustration is designed to uh, generate a center element every, one, every time the Wilson, uh, the, the closed surface links a, a given Wilson loop. So this is designed to uh, generate an average of center elements, okay? Um, but uh, if you introduce here now uh, also non-oriented vortices, this Wilson action should be supplemented with an ensemble of uh, adjoint word lines. These adjoint word lines uh, play the, uh, the role of the monopole word lines, which are adjoint objects. In this case, you have uh, that the, uh, the SUN variables, which are in the Wilson action, that they can form singlets with their joint uh, variables in the, in the monopole ensemble to produce this correlation between uh, uh, surfaces at, uh, attached to uh, word lines of monopoles. Okay. And uh, you have different uh, possibilities for these, uh, these combinations. So of course, you consider all possible uh, configurations. And uh, you have here some lattice model, model uh, which in principle, when you uh, compute this, this function here, you'll get the, the average of a lot of center elements. And the, every center element will be associated, generate, uh, will, be given, uh, will be given by a linking number, which depends on uh, the linking number between the surface and the, the, the Wilson loop, okay? So of course, this is something which is crazy to do some calculations here, but if you consider the ninth limit here, uh, the ninth limit is changing the Wilson action by the young action with frustration here. Uh, you have here some Wilson action with frustration and the adjoint allonomies in the lattice are changed by adjoint allonomies in the continuum. You get something like this, and here's something, uh, you have a lot of uh, Wilson, uh, the, of monopole word lines uh, with all poss possible correlations. And uh, we, you can uh, weight uh, every Wilson, uh, every monopole word line by uh, phenomenological properties as uh, stiffness and, uh, and tension. And using polymer techniques, we get to this effective field theory, which is, uh, 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 because the, the Wilson lines, the, um, the, the adjoint allonomies that uh, represent the monopole word lines, they generate effective adjoint Higgs fields in this, in this, in this world. So this is the proposal. You, you can see that naturally the consideration of uh, oriented uh, center vortices, but also a mix, uh, these, these configurations mixed with a sector of non-oriented objects uh, give to this type of field uh, content, a, a gauge field, a non avalanche gauge field lambda, which is the, the continuum limit of these uh, SUN link variables that were used to generate the closed center vortices. Um, this, is, this lambda is a dual field, some kind of dual field. And, but the, the role of the monopoles is to produce these effective adjoint uh, Higgs fields and you have different flavors of adjoint Higgs, Higgs fields because, because you have different possible charges for the monopoles. The monopoles have charges which are differences of defining weights of SUN. So you have a lot of different charges with different matching rules also for monopoles. So at the end, you have some theory which can easily, you have um, um, uh, different flavors here. Uh, you have I flavors, you have a flavor index, you can uh, construct very natural models, uh, which are supposed to uh, represent all these ensemble of oriented and non-oriented center vortices in, in an effective way. And these models with this field, field content, they can easily uh, have this transition as a, a spontaneous symmetry breaking from SUN to the center. So when you, you the idea is okay, now when you have this kind of effective models with these a spontaneous symmetry breaking, you can, uh, of course, the spontaneous symmetry breaking is realized in the phase where the center vortices condense. Okay. So 
with these uh, models, you can explain these uh, these different properties. You can, for example, uh, because you have a, a complete breaking from SUN to the center, so uh, at the end there are there are no Goldstone modes, Goldstone modes left. And you can compute many quantities just by a subtle point. So when you consider, uh, for example, a, a pair of quarks and the quarks here, uh, you'll get a flux tube, which is in the fundamental representation, the fundamental uh, flux between fundamental quarks. And of course, you will get also a, a loser term, term. This loser term is because you have a real object, which is a real flux tube, which goes from the quark to the anti quark. So, for example, if you forget about the monopoles, people get some uh, some uh, linear potential with a, a, a tension which depends on nullity, but it's some, some kind of uh, extensive property because this is not a real object from my point of, our point of view. You, you, you don't have still the, the loser term. And in fact, the lattice simulations based on projected center vortices, just considering the center, L, uh, center lattice, the lattice in the center of the group, these kind of ensembles, they do not reproduce the loser term. So you don't have still some, you don't have some object which is fluctuating. You don't have the soliton, the flux tube between a quark and anti-quark. So to, 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 to have something which fluctuates, you need the monopoles because the monopoles provide the correct spontaneous symmetry breaking to have a flux tube, which is a real object. So, so you have a linear potential, which is not simply due to some, okay, you have one over a P to the fourth or something like that. You have something which is really some tension associated with a confining flux tube. Okay. Um, how many minutes do we have? Yeah. Mitch? Ah, okay, great. So uh, th this is the one one of the main messages. This was done in 2018, but the, the, with our group with David and, and Gustavo, we've been doing different works. Where on the one hand we, understand, we try to understand this type of effective models, uh, the, you can compute the numerical solutions. We see all the properties, and on the other hand, we go from the uh, point of view of, of the ensembles to see uh, which kind of effective model is generated by some particular uh, type of ensemble. But it's really clear what the, the, the effect of monopoles, although they produce the same center element than oriented uh, center vortices. The, the effect of non-oriented vortices is really uh, 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 essential to understand all the properties, of, the main features of confinement, which is the generation of a flux tube. Uh, if you introduce here a, a, a pair of quarks in the adjoint representation instead of the fundamental representation, uh, you get in these models, in these effective models, it, it's easy to see that the, the, the string breaks at asymptotic distances because the adjoint quarks can be uh, can be um, screened by some adjoint excitations. These adjoint excitations are kind of uh, balanced gluons that you have in this effective model, which uh, which can uh, screen the adjoint quarks. Of course, they cannot screen the the fundamental quarks. Okay, so for fundamental quarks, you have confinement, but for adjoint quarks, they are not confined as it should be. Okay. And but this, this is the correct picture because when you consider all these ensembles of central elements with oriented objects, it is really simple to see, ah, okay, the, the, the originality, the, the, the string tension when you consider quarks in the adjoint is, 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 is trivial because uh, you have uh, simply that in the adjoint it is blind to the center. So when you do some average of central elements in the joint, you are doing the average of one. So <laughs> there's nothing there. That's that's clear. That, that, that's very, uh, very very simple to understand. But the point is, no, no, no. I want to understand what, the process of the breaking of the joint string. To understand this, you need this the monopole degrees of freedom. These non-oriented objects, which, by the way, they are detected in the in the lattice. So, but people ignore in the way when they try to understand what's going on. But the point is, no, no. Okay, you should introduce them because in that case you can understand the physical procedure the physical process that leads to the string breaking of uh, between adjunct quarks
spallens gluon because it's uh, something which is in that joint that screens a quark in that joint. So you said, ah, is it possible to have this isolated? So when you look at the, uh, the, tip, the, the type of vacuum you have, this spontaneous symmetry breaking from SUN to the center uh, leads to a vacuum manifold, which is the adjoint representation. Objects, point like objects, like a valence gluon. So valence gluons are confined. So this is the, the result with, um, this is already established. We did this. I did this proposal in 2018, but since then we are working with David and Gustavo in these different effective models and ensembles. Okay. Uh, you also have the tetrachord potential, which is a double Y-shaped, and between uh, uh, quarks you have the Y-shaped potential, which is seen at asymptotic distances. So this is also reproduced, and you have a also, uh, the, 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 the profile of the electric field of the confining uh, flux tube is nielsen olesen And in these non abelian models, we when, where you get this uh, this, uh, this is the previous calculations we, we did with Verkatering about, about um, the ability. Distances, which is a contender with the sign law, but in fact the sign law and the Casimir law are really quite close. So, we, we, we any one of the possibilities which are contenders in the lattice is well uh, accommodated in, in these models. So the the point is that here uh, this is the, the work we did with David now and, and and Hugo, because we said okay we have I have this argument this this uh, way of. Uh, this proposal where a, 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 a lattice field theory, which is SUN with frustration, generates an affected model with Higgs fields in the correct phase to understand the physics. And you could say, no, but there is quite strange because th this is naive continuum limit, because in fact, you should consider those surfaces with stiffness, the surfaces generated. Uh, yeah, how many? Two minutes. The surfaces that are generated have uh, no stiffness in my model. So this is kind of a uh, continuum limit. What we did was to consider a, a wave functional approach in the, in the wave functional representation. Uh, we have a, a wave function which depends on the, uh, on, on, on the real space here. And uh, we consider all the, uh, the real space counterparts of the configurations when we have in, in four dimensions, in four dimensional space, you have a monopole, a well surface. Here you have a, a monopole loop, a center vortex loop. Then when you have this configuration where you have matching of three for SU3, you have this configuration here for, for in, in, the, in the wave functional. And when you consider um, this configuration here, uh, th these configurations also you can introduce these configurations at the level of the gauge field potentials in, in cart with Cartan variables. You can do this, everything with Cartan variables. That's what's, in, what's interesting. We, we, instead of considering those crazy world surfaces, we consider sections at fixed time. Then we consider the, the Schrodinger representation. We did, a, again, a model for, to, uh, to, to present the wave functional of the vacuum, which is localized on an ensemble of or center vortices, but, but now this ensemble, they are uh, gauge fields. They are not just crazy dual variables in, in, in the former model. And it, with this, uh, you can then, you, ca you can uh, go to the uh, dual representation change in the electric, the uh, vector potential, you can Fourier transform to the electric field representation. So here the duality is done completely in, in a completely in a natural way, which is ju just doing a Fourier transform. It's not something again crazy. In this context, we can introduce stiffness for the vortex lines, which for the world surfaces in the in the four-dimensional models is really hard because you have should have some extrinsic extrinsic curvature, extrinsic 
curvature, which is impossible to implement in the model. But here you can easily in, uh, introduce the effect of, uh, of uh, stiff, stiffness. And uh, then again, we compute the, the calculation of the ensemble of, of, of these objects, and we get to this effective model. We, we obtain that the vacuum wave functional can be represented in terms of a field theory. That's a point. The vacuum wave functional of, uh, uh, of this ensemble of center vortices in three plus one dimensions, which is a, a vacuum wave functional concentrated on center vortices oriented and unoriented, uh, has a representation in the electric field representation in terms of effective fields. So with these effective fields, again, when you consider the effect of the, uh, of the uh, non-oriented component, again, you have the appropriate uh, symmetry breaking you have u u one to the n, which is present in the uh, at the beginning, but it, this is spontaneously breaking to z n, and this is the uh, correct uh, symmetry breaking to have the main walls in the model when you compute the average of the Wilson loop. This is again of problems of computing some soliton, and 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 you compute the, the scaling of the, the the tension of this uh, as obtained with, from the Wilson loop. Again, you get this. Uh, this Casimir scaling. Okay, so we get, uh, you make contact. We make contact with the former proposal of 2018, but now in a more controlled setting where you have one-dimensional objects, an ensemble of these one-dimensional objects instead of these world surfaces without stiffness. Now we have a control on, on the continuum limit of the effective model in the in, inside this proposal of uh, ensembles of oriented and unoriented center vortices. So we get the same physics. So, in principle, this is <laughs> to our understanding and explanation of confinement. Okay. okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Uh, time for one, <laughs> one question. Which one? Uh, let, let them. <laughs> okay. Uh, all these calculations are being done in three plus one, yeah, because we are here in the in the Schrodinger representation of field theory. So you, uh, the, the 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 states are functionals of the vector potential, but this is at the fig, at the given time. The, this vector potential in the Schrodinger representation is not as a, it, it's you have the 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 dynamical variable is the vector potential, which depends only on the three dimensional sp physical space. And then you have the evolution of this state in the Schrodinger presentation, which, and then you have the, the, the time, but, but the, 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 the degrees of freedom are, are just the fields which depend on the physical space. Okay. So I have more questions, but I, I, I... a short question. Uh, yeah. Well, Sigma. Uh, it is originated from uh, uh, when you model these ensembles, you, you, you introduce the information that uh, center vortices percolate. In, then you have to introduce that center vortices have a, tension, a negative tension. But hang, yes, yes, this is phenomenological. You, you have a negative tension, but the positive stiffness. The combination of negative tension, which leads to percolating objects, together with positive stiffness, it leads to a mass scale. And this mass scale is reflected in the in sigma. It's by hand. Yes, it's a model for. Yeah, yes, because we in, in the lattice, it's observed that in a confining phase, vortices percolate. So we introduce this information in our model. Vortices percolate. So me, the tension is negative. And then you get this. Okay. Okay. So let's thank Luis again. So we are we are a little bit late, so we we just have ten minutes of, of break, okay? Another picture here. Ah, no, no, eu pego, eu pego primeiro.
Alô? So let us now start our final session. And before that, I would like to make an announcement. So just to remind you to uh, return your badges, the plastic part at least, at the reception at the end of the, the session. So now we have the pleasure to have uh, Nelson Braga from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So you have the word, please. Thank you, Bruno. I'd like to thank the organizers for this invitation to present my work here. I will talk about heavy meson dissociation described by holographic model and the configuration entropy point of view. That means how configuration entropy sees the dissociation process. Okay. This work uh, was done. There are some papers related to this done in collaboration with Luis Fernando Ferreira, Otavio Junqueira, Giancarlo Ferreira. Alfredo Vega from Chile and hold on the horse of it is here. Okay. I want to start just to give you a very simplified idea about this work in the sense of why do we study this kind of thing and what is the kind of tool that we use to study this? Okay, first part. Why are we interested in studying dissociation of heavy? vector mesons. We are interested in this topic because heavy ion collisions form a quark-gluon plasma, a new state of matter that you only get information about it in an indirect way by looking at the particles that reach the detectors after the plasma disappears or it hadronizes. Okay? It was explained yesterday by David. Okay? And the tools that we use for this, we use holographic models, models that are inspired in the ADS-CFT correspondence. They are models, not theories, okay? And we have an auxiliary tool that is to use configuration entropy. And with respect to the configuration entropy, I will show you a very recent result about a singular behavior of this quantity when we have the complete dissociation of a particle, okay? We also heard about uh, configuration entropy yesterday in the very nice talk by Rodon. Okay, so let's give you some more detail. As I said before, all the information about the plasma is obtained from the particles that we observe after there is no more plasma. The plasma is a state that is very short-lived. It lives for a very, very short time, okay? And why do we look at potomonium and charmonium that are heavy vector mesons? Because the amount or the rate of charmonium and potomonium that we find in the particles generated by a heavy ion collision where the plasma, we assume that the plasma was formed, it depends on the properties of the plasma, the temperature, the density, the presence of magnetic fields, and also something that we started studying recently is not, uh, there are a few studies about this in the literature, that is the effect of rotation or angular momentum. In non-central heavy ion collisions, you produce a strong magnetic field. Okay, because charged particles move very fast, but also we produce strong angular momentum and it has also an effect. We are studying this now. Okay, if charmonium and botomonium are affected by this, you can use the information. If you understand how the 
dissociation increases when the temperature increases, or how the dissociation increases, the dissociation effect increases when you have a medium with a higher density, higher magnetic field, angular momentum. You can use this information looking at the amount of bottom onion and charmonium that you find in a collision to try to reproduce what was the temperature, what was the magnetic field, what was the density, and angular momentum. Clearly, we have to use this information together with other kinds of information about the plasma, but it's a very important source of information. Okay, and how can we understand, we can model the dissociation of these particles inside a plasma using a model. Okay, we get inspiration in the ADS-CFT correspondence that is an exact duality or equivalence between a type of string theory in 10 dimensions and a gauge theory in four dimensions. This is exact, but the gauge theory involved is very different from QCD since it is an SUN theory with large N. Well, this is not a problem, and it's large, but it's also supersymmetric and conformal. This is a problem. Okay, we get inspiration from this, but this is a, an exact duality or equivalence. The things that we do are inspired in this, but are models. And it is important to state clearly that we build models for specific purposes. We do not build models that will explain quantum chromodynamics, hydronic physics. Hydronic physics is extremely complex. It's a very rich theory, quantum chromodynamics. Our models are specific. And in this case, I will discuss a model that is specific for looking at bottomonium and charmonium inside a thermal medium how they behave, how they are affected by the temperature, at which temperature they completely dissociate, at which magnetic field they dissociate and the combination temperature magnetic field. And now we are studying also rotation, but I don't have results, the final results on this now. Okay, we have inspiration on this and do, and build up models just to have a, uh, an idea, to so show you an idea about how these models are built, we can think in a simplified way. ADS space in five dimensions can be written in this form here with one conformal factor R square over Z square and another part that is just like Minkowski metric. This coordinate, this should be Z here, sorry. And we can see we can look at ADS thinking that it is a five-dimensional space that has one special coordinate. Let's call it the fifth coordinate. And this coordinate uh, is related when we map the string theory, or actually the field theory in this ADS space into the gauge theory that lives here on the boundary where Z is zero, this coordinate, this fifth coordinate, is associated with the energy scale of the gauge theory. This was understood, was found by Witten and Susky, and very soon after Maldacena proposed the conjecture. So changing this coordinate, making some modifications in this fifth coordinate is equivalent to play with the energy, to put some cutoff in the energy, to regulate the energy, because it is related to the energy in the way that you map this fifth five-dimensional theory to the four-dimensional gauge theory, okay? Or are you, can you hear, okay? Uh, sorry, okay. Uh, in, our, in this kind of holographic models that we use, we 
break this conformal invariance by, as I said, playing with this fifth coordinate, the Z coordinate, okay? And what's one? Hello? And one way to do this, this very, uh, my, the simpler way to do is, is this so-called hard wall model, where you simply put a cut in the space in the fifth coordinate, and this is equivalent to placing uh, an infrared cut off in the energy. Okay, this is a, an old story. And the ADSFT correspondence can be extended to finite temperature, and in this case, you don't have ADS space you have a black hole that is asymptotically ADS or simply ADS black hole, okay? And we can extend this idea to reproduce holographically uh, a medium with uh, finite density by using a charged black hole, a medium with magnetic field, but by uh, introducing some background fields, in your space, and also thing I think that we are studying recently, we can also reproduce uh, a medium that is rotating with angular momentum by making some kind of coordinate transformation that represents the rotation of the medium. Okay, just to give you an idea, I show here. How is your, our model? Our model, we have a vector field that represents the mesons. And we have a background that is inspired in a previous holographic model called a software model. But it has three parameters, energy parameters, that are necessary in order to fix or to adjust it. Not only the masses of the mesons, but also the decay constants. Because we realize that uh, fixing, uh, fitting only the masses of the particles, that are, is the kind of thing that most of the people do when they play with ADS, QCD, or holographic models. Only fixing, fitting the masses is not good when, uh, when you want to look at finite temperature effects, the spectral function that I will show you some examples in the next slides is affected by the decay constants. If you have a model where the decay constants, the associated to non-hadronic decays, if you don't fit the decay constants, the thermal behavior of the particles is completely wrong. <laughs> okay, we have the three parameters and we fit them in order to have the best possible decay constants, mainly not the masses. We we could find a model that is much better for the masses, but not for the decay constants, so the thermal behavior would not be appropriate. Okay, we fit these things and use this matrix that reproduce a density background field by just changing the matrix, and then solve the equations of motions for the fields that represent the mesons in these backgrounds and find the spectral function. The spectral function, in a simplified way, show us the amplitude for finding a particle or a quasi-particle in the medium with some energy, okay? And the results that we find, for example, this is for Charmonium. The blue line is the lowest temperature, 150 MeV where we have one state of charmonium in the medium. Because the important thing is that the medium is formed by the dissociation of the light flavors. The Romeson, for example, dissociates completely everything except some of the heavy flavors that survive in the medium, but dissociate partially depending on the temperature, magnetic field, and density and rotation. Okay. Huh? And, okay. <laughs> okay. And then if you increase the temperature, the peak will become wider. The height of the peak decreases, the width increases. Okay. This corresponds to dissociation. When the particle is completely dissociated, there is no peak. 
okay? And we obtain this kind of result. This is for Charmonial, this is for Botomonial, and you can note that for Botomonial, there are three blue peaks. The first one is so uh, thin, it's just a line, no, no width. This is the second, the third, Botomonial survives at higher temperatures than Charmonial, okay? This is an analysis now for the behavior under the effect of density or uh, yeah, effect of density of the medium, where again, increasing the density, all these plots are at the same temperature of 200 MeV, and we are just increasing the density and the peaks are becoming smaller, smaller. So density also increases the dissociation in the medium, okay? E and okay, this is for botomonial. This the other one was for charmonial. This is for botomonial. The peaks are higher for density. This blue one is for density zero. Then the density increasing, the peak becomes broader. All these results come in a somehow simple way from this model. That, as I said to you was conceived, was built up with this purpose of reproducing this kind of property. Not all hadronic physics, not even all the properties of heavy vector masses. And this is a result regarding the effect of magnetic field. We have the peak also decreasing here when you increase magnetic field. So all these quantities, temperature, density, magnetic field, when you increase their value, you increase the degree of dissociation. So you can get, have a hint about how to look at the number of botomonial and charmonial states that survive the collision and to relate it to temperature, and all the other properties of the medium. Okay, uh, some more results of magnetic field. And a recent study that was published this year, uh, in a recent study, we look at the effect of plasma rotation. To look at plasma rotation, we had to make a simplification. That is a simplification very similar to one that is used when one studies magnetic fields in the plasma. When, the, when you have a non-central heavy ion collision, you produce a strong magnetic field, but the, the magnetic field is certainly not uniform, not uniform. And in all the works that I know, so the magnetic field is taken as uniform. And this, okay, this is a very nice first step to understand how the magnetic field affects the plasma. Okay, for rotations, the same. When the ions collide, they are like pizzas because of Lorentz contraction. They collide, they rotate, so the geometry is complicated. We don't have a uniform rotation, okay? What we did was to study a situation that is similar in the sense of the approximation that we use to the magnetic field case. We look at, at a plasma that has a cylindrical form and is rotating around its axis, okay? So you ha we have a uniform speed of rotation that is the angular speed times the radius that just one value. Just to understand what is the effect of rotation, okay? But in the same way, as is the case in, of the magnetic field, this is not exactly the situation in the plasma where not the rotation and magnetic fields are not uniform, okay? But we look at, at the uniform rotation. So we look at a different space where the four-dimensional, the, the boundary is a cylinder, not a plane, and put the cylinder to rotate by means of uh, coordinate transformation. And the metric changes. We look at the new metric after the change in coordinates. And then in this new metric, we look at the Hawking page trans.
temperature decreases with the rotation. In the asymptotic limit of speed of light, it would be zero. We would have only a plasma phase, not a confined phase. Okay. Now let's talk a bit about the configuration entropy. How can we use it here to look at this process of dissociation? And I will show you a new result that was surprising for me, at least. And we want to explore more. OK, hold on, I explained it very well this yesterday. We defined this configuration entropy based on the, or inspired in this channel information entropy, we find basically a quantity that normally we use the energy density that must be square integrable. Otherwise, the configuration entropy will become singular. And then we define this row is normally the energy density. And we find this quantity that is the model fraction that has hold on told us can be defined in two different or three different ways, but we can define by defi dividing by the maximum to have always a positive definite configuration entropy. And for our models, what do we have to do? We have a solution that represents the quasi states of the heavy vector mesons. We call this kind of solution as quasi normal modes that are gra solutions, gravitational solutions of fields in some curved background. We take this quasi normal mode and calculate the energy density. That's simply the T0 component of the energy momentum tensor. We have the solution, it's numerical, but okay, we put it numerical. Nine minutes, oh, very good, thank you. <laughs> Enough. Okay, so we calculate. Solutions calculate the role. And in the first papers that we wrote about this, and we're studying Charmonium and configuration entropy of some of the states, we found the standard behavior of configuration entropy. This was not surprising for me. The standard behavior is that as the, this is the temperature, this is the configuration entropy. As the temperature increases, the configuration entropy increases. An increase in the configuration entropy is associated to an increase in the instability of the quasi state. Okay, this is consistent. If you increase the temperature, Charmonium will dissociate more and more and more. So configuration entropy increases. Oh, so looks nice. Yeah, but indeed, there was something missing, and we were in another paper that I will show you, questioned by a referee because, okay, it dissociates more and more, but there is some temperature, some, let's say, critical temperature, where botomonium and charmonium should disappear. And this is just a monotonic behavior. Where does the particle really dissociate, disappears in the medium? And looking more recently, to the case in this paper here with this, my student Giancarlo and Luis Fernando, previous postdoc in Chile now, previous study, we find something very interesting. Giancarlo was calculating numerically solutions for the configuration entropy of botomonium. And then for some values of the temperatures for the excited states, especially, he said that the numerical results, the numerical calculation becomes singular. There is no configuration entropy. The configuration entropy explodes. First, we think that, OK, there is something wrong. We are using the wrong quantity, because we know that configuration entropy must be calculated from a normalizable square, square integral function. And we look at the function, oh, this is not square integral. We cannot use it. Let's use some in different quantity. But then uh, we noticed that 
this singularity, it appeared for temperatures or magnetic fields uh, below, no? So, uh, no, greater than some critical value. And we find it, found it out that these values of temperature and magnetic fields where the configuration entropy becomes singular correspond to the values of temperature and magnetic field where the particle completely dissociates. So we decided to calculate this quantity where it is defined and analyze the behavior when we come close to the point where it becomes singular. So looking at this plot here, this is the first cited state of Botomonio. This is a configuration entropy. This is the temperature. There is a value of the temperature that when you go asymptotically to this value, the entropy increases, increases, increases. And for higher values, the configuration entropy is not defined. Not defined because there is no particle. <laughs> so there is no configuration entropy. And if the configuration entropy measures instability, disappearing is an infinite instability, let's say. <laughs> So we found this interpretation that when you have a system, a physical system like a quasi-state of Botomonio that does not exist for temperatures greater than some value, the configuration entropy is not defined. And this is not wrong. This is a sign of configuration entropy is telling us that the particle does not exist for temperatures higher. We start, if one start like we did calculating in the forbidden region, it's infinite, you don't, you think there is something wrong, but if you analyze all the region, you see that this singularity is something very important. And this is the trace, something that I, I, I felt uncomfortable in some previous studies of configuration entropy because it's always increasing with instability, but I, I never found a result like this, where you have a well-defined trace. Oh, there is one point where the particle disappears. And now we found it by finding this singular behavior. And the same thing happens also for magnetic field. If you increase the magnetic field at a fixed temperature, we also found it depends on the direction of the field related to polarization. But we found also that for some value of the magnetic field, for the first excited state of quasi-state of Botomonio, the configuration entropy explodes. Okay, thank you. So there is no more configuration entropy. Why? Because there is no more particle. Conclusion. Okay, so summarizing things I said, it's possible to describe the dissociation of heavy vector mesons in a plasma as a function of temperature to density magnetic fields. And we have work in progress studying effect of rotation in the spectrum. And holographic models also describe the variation of the deconfinement temperature, temperature with the rotational speed. And the configuration entropy measures the stability of a physical system the higher the C, the more unstable. But for Botomonio quasi-state, we found that this differential, the configuration entropy diverges for temperatures or, or uh, magnetic fields above some, or greater than some values. And so the configuration entropy is not defined for values greater than this. And we found that this is not a problem. This is a solution, a solution for the question. How does configuration entropy cease the complete dissociation of the quasi-states of heavy vector mesons? Okay. And thank you very much. So if you compare the temperature with and no uh, magnetic field, is the temperature dissociation temperature larger or smaller? So you have no magnetic field, you find the dissociation temperature. Okay. Now you include 
magnetic magnetic field. So this temperature is larger or smaller than the temperature the for the same dissociation is degree exactly. is smaller. So because the effects. I have a question about the plot on the configuration entropy. Can you maybe go back to that? Sure. Because uh, usually I I think, I don't know if it's too naive that this dissociation happens when you have the plasma and you put the, the particles in the plasma somehow because this is like an equilibrium description, right? And if, if you go down like uh, to 100 MeV, you shouldn't have a plasma anymore, right? For example, the, the yeah, red curve and... Are, sure, yeah. In some of our studies, we extrapolate and consider what would be a supercooled plasma. We analyze the plasma temperatures where you are completely right. There is no plasma. We just extend the model and justify, okay, we are looking at what would happen if you have a supercooled and stable phase like this, but really the plasma does not exist there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And also, can you compare to other uh, approaches, uh, this uh, dissociation temperatures that you find? Some... Yeah. And, uh, now, uh, this result we get here, we got in this paper, is consistent with some of our previous results that we compared with results from uh, other approaches and normally they have a some large arrow bar but they are consistent with them okay and Nelson, i have a, a question regarding angular momentum and the magnetic field i, I wonder if you are interested in telling them both both yeah and uh, one one Thing that is uh, interesting is the effects are related. You no, know, the effect of magnetic field and rotation, and we still don't know how to relate them. But you mean the, to start the com combined effect? Yeah, this would be great. Yeah, yeah, because they should be present at the same in the same situations, in non-synchronous heavy ion collisions. Yes. We started by just looking at rotation. It took us some time to understand how to put rotation because I put if I put two pizzas rotating and it was a crazy thing. Then we saw that many people that look at rotating black holes, they consider cylindrical geometries. Then okay, a cylindrical geometry, I can understand, I can describe the speed is constant, uniform also. But uh, combining the effects would be great, and to know what is the strongest effect? And uh, yeah, very good. And also, uh, thanks for the very nice talk. And it's yeah, quite amazing to see this uh, confer configurational entropy working. Uh, so I need to read more. But uh, I had a small question about the cylindrical geometry you use. This your uh, rotation uh, it solves the equations of motion or yeah so nice it's a solution equation. Equation. yeah it, this was questioned by the rest of this paper this it was not review. and we show because we, we it's just a general coordinate transformation in the so the equations of Einstein are invariant on that we had to add this explanation in the paper because it was questioned by the referee yeah the rotation preserves Einstein's equation our background <laughs> that we use for the model does not it's a button up but the, the metric itself so is, is, as soon as you have a metric you can make it uh, cylindrical and rotating yeah 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 the first thing that we did was to Use a cylinder, just then rotate the cylinder by a coordinate transformation is a general. Ah, but you need the cylinder. Yeah, we started away. We don't have our ADS. The boundary is not a plane. It's a hyper cylinder. Hyper cylinder because it has two axes, <laughs> because there are three coordinates. It's not uh, yeah, it's equivalent to compactifying uh, one of the directions. But you, you have a hyper cylinder because 
there are the, the, this uh, boundary is three dimensional in space, three space plus one time. So the cylinder has one angular direction and two orthogonal directions. So, so I cannot see the cylinder, but it's like this. So we start with this space and the uh, important thing, the curvature of the cylinder is the same as that of ABS because there's just one compactified direction. S1 has zero curvature, S2 no. If we put a sphere, we would have a problem because the curvature will change and the ABS has this constant negative. One of the things that we got worried when we started this was changing the curvature would be strange because ABS, but no, it doesn't change because it's just one compact dimension, the curvature of the space is exactly that of ADS. Compactifying this direction does not change the curvature. So unfortunately, we don't have any more time. So let us thank Nelson again. Ah, sim, lá em cima aqui do Zoom, né? Ah, perfeito. Beleza. É bom, não precisa se preocupar com essas coisas. Tá, eu vou controlar o tempo, mais ou menos 10 minutos e 3 minutos antes. Eu vou dar uma olhada aqui também, mas aí eu vou dar uma olhada aqui também. Eu vou dar uma olhada aqui também. Tá bom, posso começar então? So, the next speaker is Romulo Rujamon, from the uh, Federal University of Goiás. So, Romulo, please, you can start. So, uh, good morning to everyone. I would like to thank the organization for the invitation to present this talk here. So I will talk about uh, some thermodynamic properties and transport properties of the hot and baryon dense quark gluon plasma. And I will show you some results that come some from, from some uh, work done in collaboration with these people here, Joaquin Greffa, Shail Portillo and Professor Claudia Hart from the University of Houston, and Professor Jorge Noronha and Jacqueline Noronha Rosler and Mauricio Hippet from the University of Illinois. So this is the outline of the talk. I will begin with a brief introduction to the problem that I will be approaching using the holographic duality, using specifically this kind of model here, which is called uh, einstein maxwell gelato model. And then I will show you some comparison from predictions we obtained from this holographic model compared to first principle large QCD data and also some hydrodynamic simulations of heavy ion data. So uh, the main kind of problem that we are interested in approaching here is the this uh, what's called the standard model of heavy ion collisions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have at the present uh, self-consistent microscopy understanding of this kind of system. Okay. In principle, the space-time evolution of the system producing heavy ion collisions should be described by qu quantum chromodynamics. But in order to describe all these stages producing heavy ion collisions, we would need to solve quantum chromodynamics with an arbitrary value of the coping and also consider uh, the calculations at real time. So this is something that we cannot do at present. So the models that are able to actually describe heavy ion data are the phenomenological models that comprise several different stages. So you have a model that describes the initial conditions, which are this color glass condensate. Here we begin by accelerating two heavy ion to speeds very close to the speed of light. And at very high energies, the number of gluon density inside these hazards increase very high and uh, saturates at some, at some very high number occupation here, form the state of matter that's which is called the color, color glass condensate, which is the source of initial conditions for, for the 
have high collisions. And the next stages of this process here contemplates also what is called the glasma, which is a stage that is intermediate between the, the color glass condescent and the quark gluon plasma. In this glasma state, we have a turbulent medium, which is dominated by very high coherent gluons. So we have a dominance of classical chromodynamic fields at this stage here. And at this stage, the medium is not described by hydrodynamics, okay? So as the system keeps expanding and cooling down, eventually it becomes to hydrodynamize, which means that at some time between uh, one to 10 firm oversee after the collision. One firm oversee is something between 10 to minus 24 to 10 to minus 23 seconds after the collision. So we are talking about a very short lived uh, medium here. Uh, it formed a medium that can be described by the equations of uh, relativistic viscose hydrodynamics, which is thermalized quark gluon plasma. And um, after the crossover uh, transition, actually there is no actual phase transition between the, the hadronic phase and the partonic phase, at least at small baryon chemical potentials. There is a smooth analytical crossover. And after this smooth, uh, smooth analytical crossover, we have a hadron gas phase and the decays of this hadron will reach the, the detectors and we provide several information about these previous stages of heavy ion collision. And the focus of the model that we, I, I will describe for you will be specifically at this stage here, which refers to the quark gluon plasma that can be described by hydrodynamics, okay? We will not be describing the hadron gas, which is impossible to do, with holography, I will explain you, you why. And we'll also, also not describe this other stage here. So we have some interesting uh, properties and records that are held by the, uh, the quark gluon plasma. It's the hottest fluid ever produced in nature. So in heavy ion collisions, the temperature of the medium varies between 400 and V to 150 MeV. This 150 MeV here is the typical value of the temperature within the crossover window. Okay. And at the beginning of the universe, between 10 to, min to minus 8 to 10 to minus 5 seconds after the Big Bang, the temperature of the medium was much higher than what we achieved in, ha in heavy ion collisions. It's also the most vertical fluid ever produced in nature with a vorticity of the order of 10 to 22 rotations per second. This result appeared in this, this publication by Nature in 2017. It's also the tiniest fluid ever produced in nature with a radius between one firm to 10 firm. And it's also the most perfect or less viscous fluid ever produced in nature, which can be measured by the ratio between the shear viscosity to entropy density ratio. And this is the result correspond to the quark gluon plasma. Okay. So I will be uh, focusing here uh, both in thermodynamic and transport properties of the quark gluon plasma. But regarding uh, the phase diagram of the, the, the QCD at finite temperature and barium chemical potential, uh, what we know for sure is that there is no actual phase transition when the barium chemical potential is small, okay? You see that we pass from the hadron gas phase to the quark gluon plasma within a smooth analytical crossover here, the free energy of the of the medium here is analytical, okay? So there is no actual phase transition here. So, but it's expected that an actual phase transition will take place at larger values of the baryon chemical potential. 
and it is expected from model calculation that this will be related to a first order phase transition that will eventually end at a critical point that is itself a point of second order phase transition. Okay. Uh, the calculation of, uh, of thermodynamic properties of QCD at very large values of the barium chemical potential is very difficult to do in light simulations due to the fem stadium problem. And related to this, to, to this problem, there is also the difficult to calculate transport coefficients that must be done at real time. And these are two diff difficult uh, kinds of tasks for first principle at QCD calculations. So usually we need to resort to some kinds of models to, to investigate these kinds of problems. Okay, so there is the number journal Lazinho approach, for instance, and here I will be using the holographic duality within this class of models here, which we call einstein maxwell gelato models. Okay, here we have uh, another important uh, property of the quark gluon plasma producing heavy ion collisions, but this is related to transport properties. Okay. So here we have the, the multiplicity of charged hadrons, uh, the mean transverse momentum and the anisotropic flow coolants. We have here the elliptic flow, the triangular flow and the quadrangular flow. All of them measured as functions of the centrality class of the collisions. And we see that it's possible to describe well all these experimental observables simultaneously using uh, phenomenological models where the, the profiles for the shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity are given here, for instance, okay? Uh, the problem here is that these profiles here were not calculated by any kind of microscope mo model, okay? They were proposed exactly to match this uh, experimental data here. So if, you are, we, if we are interested in obtaining a microscopic understanding of these results here, it would be interesting to have a microscope model that would allow us to calculate, for instance, the shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity, okay? So this is a summary of the situation that we have. Uh, we have some prerequisites to have an effect microscope model for the quark gluon plasma. Uh, this should present an agreement with Latsky's the equation of state for the values of the temperature and the barium chemical potential that can be simulated in Latsky's. Okay, it should comprise the nearly perfect fluidity of the quark gluon plasma, which is encoded in a small value for the ratio between the shear viscosity and the entropy density of the major. And this small value is valid, is holds close to the crossover window. Okay. And as I showed you before, the bulk viscosity should display this peak here also close to the crossover region. Okay. And some challenges that the unaffected model should be able to, to approach are the following. We should be able to go beyond light skills to the calculations and do a large scanning of the phase diagram, look for a possible critical endpoint and a first order phase transition line in the phase diagram of the model. Okay. We should be able to calculate thermodynamic and transport properties of the quark gluon plasma, include the putative phase transition regions. Okay. And this is a long term uh, challenge because this is really very difficult. We should be able also to calculate far from equilibrium relation of the system from initial stage to hydrodynamization and thermalization. Okay, well, this is very difficult to do. So, uh, the tool I'm going to employ here to try to construct a microscope effective model for the quark gluon plasma is the holographic gauge gravity duality. And it has been explained by Professor Nelson before. I, I will just point out some important points here, which are the following. Uh, 
Suppose that the strong coupled quantum field theory that we are interested in describing lives at this part here of this picture, okay? This is a strong coupled quantum field theory that lives in a flat boundary. And we have this extra dimension here, which is related to the scale, to the energy scale of this uh, quantum field theory, which we are interested to describe, okay? The holographic gauge gravity plot will essentially uh, map physical observables defined in this strong coupled quantum field theory into uh, observables that are described in a classical gravity theory with at least one extra dimension, okay? So um, a gauge gravity model or a holographic model is essentially defined by a gravity action, okay? okay? I will show to you next uh, the kind of uh, action that I will be using here. But if you define an action, in principle, you have defined a holographic model, okay? So the holographic gauge gravity duality is actually a framework. And as a framework, which is similar to quantum field theory, you can define several different models to try to model at different kinds of phenomenologies, okay? So for instance, you can use the holographic gauge gravity duality to try to describe um, high temperature superconductors, for instance. So this is, would be a very different kind of modern that I will show to next, okay? But once you have defined uh, a gravity action, you have uh, an holographic model, but you can consider this holographic model in different kinds of dynamic situations, okay? And these dynamic situations will be defined by the kind of boundary conditions that you are considering for your problem, and also by the kind of answers that you are using for the fields that appear in the gravity action. So, for instance, if you consider this higher dimensional space-time here with no horizons inside it, then you have the dual quantum field theory to this gravity action here defined in vacuum, okay? But now if you consider a back hole in equilibrium inside this book, this will induce a thermal state in equilibrium here at the boundary. And then you can study the thermodynamics of the same, of the same quantum field theory that we were considering before, okay? I'm not changing the theory. I'm just changing what is happening inside the bulk. Then I can pass from a vacuum situation to a thermal situation, for instance. And then if I slightly disturb the horizon of this black hole here inside the bulk, and study, for instance, the quasi-normal modes of this black hole here, I can study thermal quantum field theory out of equilibrium, most, but actually near equilibrium. And this corresponds to study the hydrodynamics of this quantum field theory defined at the boundary. And the most interesting, the most difficult uh, task here would be to consider uh, the far from equilibrium dynamics of this same quantum field theory here. And the point here is the following. Uh, to study any of these situations here, the vacuum, the thermodynamics, and also the hydrodynamics, in practice, we just need to consider uh, a set of couple ordinary differential equations where all the fields and perturbations that we need to solve at the end of the day only depends on this extra dimension here. But now if I allow that the, all my fields here also depend on the dimensions parallel to the boundary, for instance, if we have non-trivial dependence on time and the space dimensions parallel to the boundary, then I can study the far from equilibrium dynamics of this system, okay? Then in this case, I need to use the tools of numerical general relativity, and I need to uh, consider a system of couple partial differential equations, okay? Here, I will just describe the thermodynamics and the hydrodynamics of the quark gluon plasma, and not the far from equilibrium dynamics, which is much more difficult, okay? So the kind of a specific model that we are going to consider here is described by this gravity action here, 
which is a nice thing, Microsoft Gelatin action. Okay, this Gelatin field here is just a real scala field here, which is used here to break the conformal symmetry of the Bondari quantum field theory. Okay, I have also uh, an Amelian gauge field here, which you do is is used to introduce the chemical potential, and the metric field, which is due to the Bondari energy momentum tensor. So this first term here is just the Einstein-Hilbert action. Here I have the contribution related to the geloton field. And here I have a coupling between the, the Maxwell field and the geloton field, yeah, and also the metric field here. Okay. And I also have some boundary terms here, which I'll not have time to discuss here. And the specific model within this class of einstein maxwell gelton actions that I will be considering here is given by these parameters here. So the gelaton potential is given by this potential here. This coupling function here between the gauge field and the gelaton is given by this expression here. The five-dimensional Newton's constant is given by this value here. And the inverse of the asymptotic AGS radius given by this energy scale here. So where did these, these results come from? They come from solving these equations of motion here, and then applying the holographic dictionary to calculate the Bondari quantum field theory observables. And then we try to match the results from the holographic model with the results for large QCD, specifically for this set of four observables, which are the, the entropy density, the pressure, the speed of sound squared, and also the trace anomaly of the energy moment tensor, all of them calculate at zero barrier chemical potential. Okay. So these results here are not predictions of the model. Actually, these, the, these points with the error bars are the results from light skill CG. And the curves are adjusted to fix the, the model parameters of the actual maxwell Genoto model. So these results here come from trying to match with the holographic model using the holographic dictionary, these results from large QCD. Okay. So next, what I will show to you are actual predictions obtained from this model compared to large QCD calculation. Okay. Okay. So first, the results for the baryon susceptibility. Here we have the second order baryon susceptibility up to the eighth order body susceptibility. So Kai Chu is actually simply the second derivative of the pressure with respect to the baryon chemical potential. Kai 4 is the fourth derivative of the, of the pressure with respect to the baryon chemical potential and so on, okay? These results were obtained first in this paper here from 2017. And if you take a look in this paper here, we have made a prediction for K8, but at that time, there was no calculation from light skewsity for this observable. So in the paper, this result for K8, we have just this blue curve here. The results from light skewsity came up in the next year. And this paper here, we just compared the, the prediction that we obtained for K8 with the light results at zero chemical potential, and we can see that they agree very well, okay? So here we have actual predictions from the holographic model compared, compared to light skills in the results. These are the results for the baryon susceptibility. Uh, here are the results for the equation of state. Up to the higher values of baryon chemical potential that can be simulated, in state of that light skills in the simulations. Here we have the results for the pressure and here for the entropy density compared with the, the outcomes from light skills. Uh, 
Here we have the results for the internal energy density, and here for the body charge on density. And here we can see that for the body charge density at high temperatures and high and high values of the body and potential, we can see the limitations of this of this holographic model. Okay, we can no longer uh, achieve a quantitative agreement with large scale CD in this region here. Okay, so. In this model, we have a definite prediction for the location of the QCD critical point coming from holography. So we predict that the critical points of QCD would be located in this region here, okay? And in terms of something that can be measured experimentally, here we have the center of mass energy of the, of the collisions. And in this window here, this uh, this is something that can be probed in the CBM experiment at FEP and also in the in RIC operation in the fixed target mode. Okay. And here we have some dynamical results, uh, specifically for the bulk of the Scott calculator at zero chemical potential. This is actually uh, also a prediction from the holographic model. And this black curve here is the, the result from the einstein maxwell gelato model that I showed you at zero chemical potential. And these uh, blue and red curves here are the results from Bayesian analysis of uh, effective models simultaneously matching several heavy ion data. Okay. So you can see that we have uh, at least a value of the bulk of the scots in the ballpark of the that are favorite in have seven a limitation of model which cannot describe hadron thermodynamics such in at low temperature. Because in the confining phase, the pressure goes like NC to zero, okay? But in the deconfining phase, since we are considered large N, it goes to NC squared. So we need to consider string loop corrections in the book. So it's no longer just the gauge gravity duality. At sufficiently high temperature, any holographic dual model in the classical supergravity limit goes to a strong copy ultravarious fixed point, therefore missing a strategic freedom. And this is manifest, for instance, in the fact that eta over s is equal to one over four pi at all energy scales. So there is no aesthetic freedom for classical supergravity models. Okay. Okay. It also predicts too much energy loss with a jet quench parameter, which is significant above the values obtained from model fields to nuclear mod modification factor at RIC and LHC. And there is no rigorous theoretical justification yet for this kind of model because we don't have an explicit embedding into string field. Okay. So I'm finishing here. The thermodynamics of our Aston Maxwell models in good agreement with state of the art light skill results at finite baryon chemical potential. Nearly perfect fluids is naturally enclosed in. Uh, almost any kind of holographic model. And the bulk of the Scott match well with the profile in favor in hydrodynamic simulation described experimental heavy ion data. Okay. And the, our prediction for the location of the QCD critical endpoint is within the reach of upcoming low energy heavy ion collisions experience, mainly at CBM, at FAIR, and at RIC operating in fixed tag and mode. Okay. And some future perspectives, we are conducting now a Bayesian analysis of the robustness of the phase transition regions predicting for the for QCD using the EMD class of holographic models. We are planning to uh, calculate the diffusion of conservative pyrium, strangeness and electric charges, the production rates of thermal photons and leptons in the, in the spectrum of quasi-normal modes and the, the associated equilibration times in the phase transition regions. And the long-term project, we also plan to calculate the far-frontal dynamics and using numerical relativity. 
And this is the final slide. Uh, there is this Muses project here. You can access the, the page of this project with this link here. Muses here means the modular unified solver of the equation of state. And this is a project where people are trying to describe the QCD equation of state, uh, but comprise several different uh, effective models to cover the different parts of the, of the, of the phase diagram. So for instance, people are trying to describe the, the region that is relevant for heavy ion collision and the baryon density quark gluon plasma, where the, the order of the magnitude of the, of the chemical potential is the same of the temperature. And here we are above the crossover region. Okay? In this region specifically, our model will be used to, to integrate this model here. And also other, other regions that cannot be described by our model, but are described by all the kinds of effective approach, like uh, the region that is relevant for the hadron resonance gas phase, and also the region that is relevant for the physics of the neutron star. Okay. So let's see. So thank you very much, Homolo, for your talk. Would we have any questions? Thank you, Homo, for your very interesting and clarifying seminar. Uh, Homo, can you uh, go back to such graphic where there's a uh, blue? Yes. Um, this year, a group from, from Munich and Helsinki, they, they published a uh, uh, an experimental result regarding the bulk viscosity uh, over the uh, entropy density. Uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, my 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 question is: You based it on Jetscape in Duke, or you used also such more recent um, result for for the bulk viscosity? Okay. So uh, this result for the bulk viscosity, we have not used any of these of these results here. Okay. This is a prediction of the model. I'm just compared with these results which come from Bayesian analysis. Okay. Okay. B because this this very recent paper by this group of Munich and Helsinki, this this strip is uh, a little uh, uh, the, the width is is lower. Ah, okay. Maybe it matches more with your predictions. Oh, okay, it's a three letters B published this year, and it's really very, very recent because uh, they put it archived on November of last year. But the, the strip is lower, maybe it matches okay. uh, better. Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh can you tell us something more about your choice of the dilaton potential? It looks very complicated. Yes. yes. Uh, so where does it come from and how many free parameters were in it originally? Well, here we have uh, one, two, three, four. And, and, and then the four factor F5 you choose by hand or it's computed. Uh, can you repeat? Uh, uh, v and F are ch choices made by you or they come yes. out of something? This is a choice that we made in the following way. Uh, we have this answer here for a static isotropic and transnational inverted isotermassive due to black hole in equilibrium. And then we have to solve numerically this set of equations of emotion. Then we have essentially two kinds of uh, initial conditions here. And each pair of initial conditions will produce a point in the phase diagram. And the, the initial conditions are the value of the gelatin field at the black hole horizon and the value of the radial derivative of the Maxwell field also calculated at the, at the black hole horizon. So we have to choose many different values for this pair of initial conditions. And then we start to populate the, the phase diagram of the model. And then we have a map of for instance, how we can calculate the temperature of the baryon chemical potential, the baryon charge density, and the temperature of the, of the quantum field theory. And also this 
all the observables here, for instance, the entropy is just the Bekenstein Hawking entropy and so on. And then we have to adjust the gelatin potential and the, that function f of phi in order to the results of the holographic model match the the QCD results. Yeah, but how do you come up with a uh, hyperbolic seconds, uh, cosinus hyperbolicus? No, Just, uh, the, uh, the, the the hyperbolic functions are very natural. What's not what is unnatural here are the polynomial yeah. the polynomial terms because the these exponentials here are very natural to 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 appear from the string compactifications, but. Uh, the problem here are actually the, these polynomial terms here, okay? But this is based actually in the original works by Gubset and, and, and collaborators. Actually, the, the potential that was proposed by Gubset, uh, I think that had just two terms like this, but uh, the numbers were not the same. But in order to actually have a fine tuning with, with the large result, we Needed to to put the the fourth for term and the sixth of the term. Okay, thank you. But thank these parameterizations here are, are not unique. Okay, this year uh, it appeared in the literature to a competing group from China, and they also can uh, obtain good agreement with large QC results with a different parameterization than we have. And the prediction for the location of the critical points that they obtain is significantly different from ours. So this is the reason why we are now conducting a Bayesian analysis uh, of the robustness of the phase transition regions obtained within this class of, of holographic models. Okay. Alphonse. Yes, uh, I have just one question regarding the critical point. Okay. Uh, I wonder if you uh, are interested, you have already calculated something regarding the behavior of the thermodynamic quantities like pressure, for example, as you reach the critical point, and maybe uh, also uh, viscosity coefficients. Is there something special going on when you like some criticality, some critical exponents? Okay, uh, the, the the question about the the creature the the creature the critical exponents is very difficult from the numerical point of view. We try to calculate it, but we we, we are facing uh, numerical difficulties to to calculate uh, the critical exponents for, for for this model. But for instance, here we have the behavior of the bulk viscosity up to the the, the phase transition region. Here, the, this purple curve is at the critical point. This is the behavior. Mm -hmm. And when we pass the critical point and consider the behavior along the first or the phase transition line, you can see that there is a discontinuity gap. Okay. Uh, that's quite interesting. In this paper here, we have calculated also many other transport coefficients also related to the energy loss across the, the phase transition regions. Okay, okay. I like it. Okay, thank you. We would have time for your last uh, quick question. No? Well, if not, thank you again, Romulo. So this ends our workshop. We're very, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank everyone who came from far, from close. And please uh, don't forget to return your badges at the front desk. Have a safe return home and see you next time.